Wow. Oh. I just have to say this. Thank you for that introduction, Mr. President. <laughs> ah, I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> oh, hello, Atlanta. If you are from the South, Give a shout out, make some noise if you're from the South. All right, all right. It is great to be here with so many Southern activists. If you are psyched to be in Atlanta, make some noise. <laughs> this is gonna be a good few days, it definitely is. And you know, there are many, many years when we've come together here at Creating Change, when we could still feel the sting of the ballot box, and we were worried about the havoc that an anti-LGBT president might cause for our lives, our country, and our world. We've come together in years when our renewed hopes that some state referendum would confirm a swing in the national mindset were dashed. There have been years when we would come here to lift each other up, to assure each other that change would happen, that change was happening despite our losses and despite our fear that something might never change the national sentiment. But this is not that year. This is not one of those years. This year, we come together to celebrate. This year, this year was the year when enough people stood together, joined together, and said, enough. Enough. Enough with being marginalized. Enough with being ignored. Enough with being treated like we and our families and our votes don't count. <laughs> Women, Latinos, African Americans, and progressive people of faith came together in communities across the country and made the deciding difference at the ballot box. Last year, for those of you who are here, you will recall that both Ben Jealous, president of the NAACP and I made an urgent call to fight the voter suppression efforts that were underway, and we did. In 2012, those who sought to deny our voices went too far. And as people of color and people in poor communities went to the polls determined to have their voice, they stood there and they stood there and they stood there until they could cast their votes and be heard. That, my friends, that, my friends, is victory over oppression and victory over systemic racism. It is also a victory for human dignity. Yes, we have got to do so much more, but think of it, this year, we have a record number seven out members of Congress. We were afraid of keeping the ones we had. Record seven members of Congress with a number of firsts, as Kate said, including the first woman senator from the great state of Wisconsin, Senator Tammy Baldwin, first out lesbian senator, and in an historic first, our first out bisexual member of Congress, Representative Kirsten Sinema from Arizona. And our first out Japanese American Congressman, Mark Takano of California. I saw, all, I saw all of them earlier this month when they all get sworn in, and I am tell you, telling you, they are ready to go. They are ready to go. The tables are turning. This year, a broad coalition of voters showed up for young immigrants in Maryland and approved a statewide DREAM Act showing our country what true opportunity looks like.
And this year, as Darlene noted, voters returned Barack Hussein Obama to the White House, who has not only demonstrated with his actions that he is the most LGBT supportive president in the history of our country, but with his inclusion of the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion in his inaugural speech, he squarely placed LGBT equality in the long lineage of movements that have had watershed moments from Seneca Falls to Selma. And, and we will work to get him to say more than just gay. As I sat at the foot of the Capitol, honored to attend inauguration, holding my daughter's hand, listening to the president, watching that fierce Latina justice, Sonia Sotomayor, swearing in the vice president, hearing a more inclusive benediction, being transported by the poetry of Richard Blanco, a gay Cuban immigrant, and of course, the invocation by civil rights leader, Merle Evers William. Well, let's just say, I thought, yes, yes, this is the country I know. This is the country I want my daughter to grow up in. What happened on the steps of, Capitol, of the Capitol earlier this week was in so many ways remarkable, real change. But it was also made inevitable because of the work you in this room and many across the country have done for decades. You made that happen. You made those words come out of our president's mouth. And this year, after losing 31 times at the ballot box, 31 times, but who's counting? This year, we won big on marriage. We beat back marriage opponent, opponents in Minnesota, and we won marriage equality in Maine and Maryland and Washington State. If you are from Minnesota, Maine, Maryland, or Washington State, stand up or raise your hand so we can applaud you. If you posted on Facebook or Twitter or otherwise to encourage people to vote the right way and stand, stand and, or raise your hand, if you contributed in any way to these wins, if you gave of your time or your money, stand or raise your hand and let us applaud you. Thank you. Thank you. The task force was proud to dedicate our staff, our money, grassroots training, leadership development support, our social media machine, and expertise in all four of these states to contribute to a history-making election. In fact, led by the task force's organizers and faith staff, I'd like to publicly thank our task force staff who worked on marriage, the Maryland Dream Act, and against the death penalty in California. Thank you, Task Force staff. As always, the Task Force did what we do best, working at the grassroots level, organizing and engaging voters, and this year, we expanded that focus by mobilizing progressive people of faith, and guess what? It worked. We knocked on doors, spoke to congregations, walked neighborhoods, and had thousands of one-on-one -on -one conversations that changed people's hearts, and we changed people's votes. And what makes our movement success this last year even more powerful, more meaningful, and more lasting is that it wasn't just the LGBT community. It wasn't just LGBT people who worked and celebrated these wins. In fact, some of the very first calls and emails I got when the president came out for marriage last spring 
And when marriage equality won in state after state after state after state, those calls were from leaders of civil rights, labor, women's, and other non-LGBT organizations. If there is one message we can take away from election night 2012, it is that we are not alone. We are not alone as a movement, we are not alone as a people, and we need to now make sure that no one else is alone either. I'm thinking about so many people here in the South and elsewhere that still face isolation. The activists fighting and living under Georgia's reprehensible immigration law. I'm thinking about the young women fighting for reproductive rights and justice in rural, often unwelcoming areas. And those, those still living in grinding, debilitating poverty, the kind of poverty we don't even want to acknowledge still exists in our country because the very fact that it still does is a raw reminder that our economy and our public policy still play favorites. For 40 years, the task force has been at the forefront of our movement's work for freedom, justice, liberation, and equality. And for 25 years, we've been meeting here at Creating Change to share strategies, gain skills, and plan the future. 40 years doesn't seem so long today, now that there's some wind at our back, the, the momentum of change growing and a little spring in our step. But we can never forget what it took us to get to this day. The struggles, the sacrifices, the loss and the pain we have been through as a movement. Those strong shoulders and brave hearts that held us up and moved us forward, some are here to, today to enjoy the fruits of our labor, but many are not because of HIV and AIDS and cancer or the sheer weight of what oppression does to a person. To honor them, we must not rest. We must not slow down. We must not stop reaching. And we must never forget where we came from. And so today, as the task force celebrates its 40th anniversary, we must look both backward and forward. Like other social justice movements before us, we have been fortunate to have dynamic, determined, smart, and passionate leaders willing to step forward to expose our nation's disturbing and painful gaps in freedom and then call on us to dig for our moral compass and push our country forward. Leaders like Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon, who still carries on despite Del's passing, like Harvey Milk, Frank Kameny, Baird Rustin, Vera Martin, Olga Vivas, and Alexis Rivera. And despite all their accomplishments, I suspect not one of them would claim to have made them alone. In communities across the country, they came together with lovers, with friends, with compatriots in the struggle for human rights, they created family, chosen family. And while the LGBT community certainly didn't invent the idea of chosen family, I believe through necessity and through our struggle to survive and to love, we may have perfected it. I've been in this movement a long time, 
And we've changed everything from the words we use to describe our love for each other to changing the words we use in our marriage campaigns. We've learned over time and through more than a few losses what truly touches people's emotions and what changes their votes. That a vote is a personal thing. That it's as much a thing of the heart as it is of the mind. And we've worked, as we've worked to gain recognition of our relationships, we've learned that talking about rights and privileges and obligations, all of those parts of marriage don't really touch people's hearts in the same way as talking about love and commitment. And so today, today, I challenge us to take to heart the words family, love, and commitment. But let's not restrict or limit them to one view of what our families are supposed to look like. Let family and love and commitment expand our lives, not restrain them. After all, from the very first moments of our modern LGBT movement, we have given shape to the word family, not the other way around. And we, out of our experience, have created beautiful, expansive, chosen families. As the saying goes, an army of lovers, or in the case of our movement, an army of ex-lovers, uh, <laughs> often makes up our families. I am, of course, not speaking for myself, just other people, of course, but. <laughs> our movement must be one that embraces the many, many ways we create and choose family. We want family that understands, that has our back, that picks us up when we need it, that pushes us further when we tire. A family that walks in the door when everyone else has walked out. And that's how I like to think of our movement and our task force family at 40 years. Sure, it can seem a bit cliche to talk about the task force as a family, organizations as families, but to those who might think it's a cliche, all I have to say is, you don't know the task force. For 40 years, the task force has been an incubator, helping to create scores of organizations across the country. Through our campaigns, initiatives, and through late night meetings here at Creating Change, <laughs> activists just like you, and in fact, many of you, have created groups that have picked up the fight for people with HIV and AIDS, for anti-violence pro programs, youth activism, the original campaigns to work against the so-called Defense of Marriage Act and Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and strengthened our movement's work against racism and for economic justice. It's why, it's why as, as we celebrate 40 years of the task force, it's really a celebration of our movement's family, a celebration of you and your work. And there's one more group here today I want to welcome to our family. Thanks to the Los Angeles LGBT Center, there's a group of 26 HIV AIDS and LGBT activists here today from China and Taiwan. I was fortunate to spend time with them yesterday. We went through a lot of pizzas. And uh, I have to tell you, I am, I am so inspired uh, by your vision and your creativity and your drive. They are the founders of the LGBT movement in China and Taiwan, and we welcome you.
again and again. We show up for each other, add new people to our family, and unfortunately at times lose members of our family. We've had an unusual number of deaths this year. Our staff and board members lost parents, grandparents, key task force volunteers, and tragically a child. And we lost a dear friend and coworker in Sandy Green, who as many of you know, was an extraordinary woman who worked for the task force for a decade and greeted people at Creating Change at the registration des desk every year. It was Sandy. Sandy was not afraid to say that as a black, straight woman, she was part of the family working for civil rights for all. I so wish, I so wish she could have seen the president's speech. She would have loved it. But loss doesn't weaken us. It doesn't have to weaken us. In this room of our chosen family, as well as those who are miles away and could not be with us, but who are family too, we must choose to be strengthened. We have known for a long time that unfortunately, there are those who dedicate themselves to trying to tear us apart, to separate us, to undermine the social progress and justice we have won. It's certainly something we've seen here in the South, something we still see. But as a movement, we can learn from our brothers and sisters in the South about sticking together as a social justice family, about perseverance, and about resistance. The politics of division and greed, the vestiges of slavery that still shape opinion and policies and still contribute to a modern systemic disenfranchisement that is yet to be overcome. This is our struggle too. And those who seek to divide us need to take a look at this room. More than 3,000 out, proud, determined, not intimidated, not going anywhere here in Atlanta, reaffirming our chosen family, our bonds of love together. Nothing, nothing can divide us. Not after what we've all been through together. I saw the true power of this commitment and this strength on election night. I was in Maine on election night. A few Mainers in the room. After a late night of celebration and being up until 4 a.m. waiting on the news of our brothers and sisters in other states, I got up, headed to the airport the next morning, proudly wearing my shockingly bright orange Yes on One t-shirt. I, under I understand Minnesota knows that, that orange too. Person after person, almost all of them straight, kept coming up and saying, finally, finally, finally. They were sharing in our joy. As I was enjoying a celebratory lobster roll at the airport for breakfast, <laughs> they have really good lobster rolls in the, in the airport there. It's, um, this, this woman came up to me and she introduced herself as Sue, of course, drawn by my orange t-shirt. Uh, she's a longtime Mainer and a captain in the US Coast Guard. She gave me what is called a challenge coin from the US Coast Guard, given for going above and beyond the call of duty. And she said, this is to remind you of who you are working for who you are helping, and by implication, how much we still have left to do and what we will need to do to defend our wins. I was inspired by Sue and how even though she has privilege, she will benefit as a service member from the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and she and her partner, who she's known since she was a kid, will now have the choice to get married in Maine if they want to. She has challenged me to remember that every day 
our work remains incomplete. And those of us who do have some privileges must never mistake that for real equality or freedom for all. I carry, uh, I carry this challenge coin with me now. It's a little constant weight in my pocket, reminding me that as we win in some areas like marriage, we must always be clear that we are not a one-issue movement. We are not a marriage-only movement. We are not an employment-only movement. We are not any other only movement. We are a movement that cares broadly about the issues that affect our lives. Some days, I wake up astonished at the pace of progress. But I also wake up angry about the lack of basic basic protections for LGBT people in our families. And I think about how, as we're in the spotlight on our, because of our progress on marriage, it can actually be more challenging to draw attention to the many other issues that affect our lives. We must educate our own community, and we must educate our country. We must choose as a basic moral value, never to leave any of our movement's family behind. Even though we've made extraordinary progress in states that now have marriage equality, and I'm thankful, I'm married, but guess what? In a number of states where we have marriage equality, we still do not have full protections for LGBT people. Think about it. Think about it. In the coming months, thousands of couples will go to Maine, Maryland, Washington, and the other states in DC where marriage is legal. Their friends and family will surround them and they will have the weddings of their dreams. And they, like our straight friends, will naturally go home, place a picture perhaps of their wedding on their desk at work, and some of them will be fired. They will get fired simply because they are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, and it is perfectly legal to do so. In four states where marriage equality is legal, a couple can invite their transgender friends to their wedding. But if those friends try to check into a hotel, they could easily and legally be denied a room simply because they are transgender. Think of that. Think of that of the recent voter suppression efforts, of the violence committed against transgender people, of the immigration discrimination, of the skyrocketing HIV infection rates in our own community when someone questions whether or not we still have work to do. Yes, as marriage equality takes a wider hold and five or more Supreme Court justices willing, we will finally end government-sponsored discrimination against couples on a federal level. Our progress on marriage has made more apparent the dangers for those who could still be left behind by our movement and by our country. As a movement, as activists, as human beings, we are called in the very midst of our joy, of our celebration, to say it is not enough unless our entire family can experience full freedom, justice, and equality. It is not enough for parents who send their children off to school each day worried if he or she will return home with a black eye, a broken rib, a crushed self-esteem, or worse. It is not enough when many of us believe we are safe but only because we have the economic privilege to move to a different city or neighborhood. That is not freedom. That is not freedom. 
We will never be whole. We will never be free until every single one of us feels safe to express ourselves sexually, intellectually, and spiritually, and find support in our homes, places of worship, and our workplaces. But I have hope. Actually, I, I'm beyond hope. I know, I know that our movement can do something extraordinary if we set our intentions behind it. I know that we will not leave any one of us behind, even as the pressures to do so are growing. We can do this. We really can. We can resist the pressure to become smaller, to narrow our sights, to be lulled into thinking that our work is almost done. So as we celebrate our wins, and we should, we earn them, let's not ease up a single moment in pushing for change. We must not leave any of our, families, our family members behind. When we win fed federal marriage equality, and we will, we must not leave behind the 31 states that will still need to overturn their constitutional bans on marriage equality. We must not be satisfied with some states that have marriage and others that do not. We must not leave behind those who will choose not to get married. We must not leave behind those who still live in the 29 states that have virtually no protections for LGBT people. We must not leave behind those who just because they don't live in a big coastal city can't kiss their lover on the street. We must not leave behind the transgender immigrant whose true self is not honored as she is detained in the men's facility. As we win protections in housing and employment and public accommodations, and we will, we must continue to ask who in our family is still hurting? Who is unable to live their lives completely free of prejudice and violence and persecution? This is our moment. This is our LGBT movement moment. But if we are to be truly transformational as a movement, we must use this moment not only to benefit LGBT people, but to benefit the country as a whole. That is our leadership challenge as a movement. This year, this year I have seen hundreds of ways we stand with each other hold each other as family, how we expand our hearts, our love, and commitment, and compassion for each other. I have seen activists risk deportation by being out about being gay and an immigrant, daring to tell the story of their whole identity. You'll get to meet them tomorrow at our plenary. I have been with reproductive rights and justice leaders as we work to make the connection between our two movements, with this week being the 40th anniversary of Roe versus Wade. This weekend, look around you. There are 3,000 stories of inspiration right here at this conference. Each one of us has had to overcome some hurdle simply to be who we are, to survive, to survive another day. We at the task force have been inspired and have inspired for 40 years. And part of what keeps us going for four decades is that we're an organization that is obsessively focused on getting things done, on making concrete and tangible and real progress. So as we step in to the beginning of our next 40 years, you can count on us to build power, take action, and create change. We will build power as we officially launch our online grassroots organizing academy, the most sophisticated online trading program in the movement and frankly, in many other movements.
We will train and support over 1,000 grassroots activists each year, and we will ensure a diverse and prepared leadership for our movement for years to come. We will take action. We will take action on a range of issues that affect the lives of LGBT people, including pushing the president to issue an executive order to protect LGBT people from discrimination who work for federal contractors. This will affect millions of people across the country until Congress can get its act together and pass the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. We will be pushing. We will be pushing to finish the work of burying Don't Ask, Don't Tell by allowing transgender people to serve openly and same-sex married service members to get the same benefits as their straight peers. We will continue. We will continue to play a leadership role as we have for years in partnering with immigration rights organizations in advocating for the many areas of, uh, areas of comprehensive immigration reform that affect our community, including security for bi-national same-sex couples, <laughs> including respectful and appropriate treatment of transgender and HIV-positive immigrants, <laughs> and ensuring that families are not separated for years on end because of our immigration laws. And I will say it clearly, creating a path to citizenship is an LGBT issue. And we will create change, we will create change the task force will continue to lead in getting smarter and more sophisticated as we partner with states on ballot measures. In the coming months, the task force, along with our colleagues at the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, will be sharing with the movement post-election research we conducted that takes a hard look at how voters actually behave across ballot measures on a range of issues like marriage and immigration, taxes, and education. Our analysis will not only help us as a movement to be smart about when we put forth ballot measures, but on exactly which voters will vote for and against us based on how they vote on other issues. We will build power, we will take action, and we will create change. I believe, I believe that all movements need, need guiding principles and values, a, a true north, and that ours must be love, commitment, and compassion. But it must be an expansive love, a broad commitment to the ways we create family and compassion that leads to action for those who are marginalized. Today, we have choices to make about the future of our movement. What will we stand for? What will we stand for? Our task force brother, poet, activist, and creator of change, William Brandon Lacey Campos, knew. What will we stand for? He died this year, but his words can still help to guide us. He wrote a poem titled, On the Occasion of a Victory for President-Elect Senator Barack Obama, which first calls out our nation's history of slavery and then reads, Stand up at the dawn of this new day Stand up and let your joy proclaim a new life, a new vision, a new way. Stand up and protect what our fight has made. The battle has raged through blood 
and pain we shall overcome will be. We have overcame. Stand up what has won can be taken away. Stand up, stand up, stand up. As we look toward our next 40 years, if we are to succeed, we must stand up. We must be a movement that is about possibility over privilege, expanding over narrowing, unity over separation, creating change over settling for what is. We are family. We are family, and we will not leave any of you behind. Thank you.